All right. And I think uh, Dylan just flashed the white power sign over there. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're live. Welcome to the actual fifth episode. Last week I did say the last one was the fifth episode, but this is the actual fifth episode of Reactionary Opinions. It's great to be here. <laughs> Uh, it's a little bit of a shift in environment for us. Um, I'm yeah, actually, yeah, where where is here, Scott? Where is here? Yeah, actually, here is actually in the home of the species known as the SJW purple-haired, pink-haired, pussy-hat-wearing woman. Mm. I am actually in Los Angeles. I'm in uh, California visiting uh, some very close friends coming down for a wedding. And um, I was actually at Universal Studios yesterday, and LA basically outdid itself because I've never seen so many purple-haired females <laughs> in my life. Um, uh, yeah, it was great. quite something, quite something. So um, obviously, I'm representing. I've got my camo cap on, which my wife says I look like trailer trash, but um, it's perfect. It's a great look. Uh, Russell is here. Dylan, yeah. yeah. Russell, tell me where you're coming from. I am stationed right here in the furthest outpost of the old uh, 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 Cape Colony, um, out here um, in, in Cathcart, um, yeah, visiting my parents. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit colder than what I'm used to there in, in, in Cape Town, but it's, uh, it's not been too bad. I ran the, went up, uh, I had a run up the mountain today and I, over, I underestimated the effect of altitude. And, uh, nice. Yeah, it was a struggle. I had a grossly underestimated the the, um, the climb. <laughs> no, so you, my, you, my, you... my lungs are a bit uh, stiff and burning. So, but I don't well, want you know, to. Of... Well, well, you know, you've got to stay fit to fight the degenerates. You know that. <laughs> yeah, so I, got, I, I, got you. I have warned you. I've got plenty of breath in me for tonight, so it's fine. That's good. Mm. That's good. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, this is going to be an interesting show. I think this is going to be one of our most interesting ones because um, today we are going to be uh, discussing democracy, whether it is sustainable, uh, the pros and cons of democracy. We're going to be making an argument for democracy. Um, I think what, I, what we're going to do is we're going to just sort of go through the points and the points of discussion today. Um, Democracy, whether it is a sustainable system, um, I would call it the failures of democracy because, you know, the world's definitely not in a great place at the moment um, and the world has pretty much adopted democracy as a, as a political system. Um, we're going to be talking about the pros of democracy or whatever the arguments are for democracy. Then we're going to be dispelling the myths of uh, democracy. We'll discuss a little bit more about representative democracies. Um, we'll also speak a little bit about direct democracy as well. And then we're going to be talking about monarchy and some of the feasible uh, points of uh, democracy and then sort of what the best choices are, um, democracy or monarchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going to... It is reactionary opinions after all. Uh, it, is, it is reactionary opinions, so we have to, um, you know... Very hey, reactionary. I was, I was actually, I was actually <laughs> very... I was actually chatting to um, a guy who's an admin on a page, a Facebook page. Um, I think I told you guys about the Christian Reactionary Facebook page. And this guy is actually from... Gosh, uh, what's this place called? Hang on. Let me Georgia? Check. No, uh, yeah, you'd think, eh? but it was actually a place we were discussing um, a while ago. Um, it's actually... Was it in Europe? Uh, no. Um, hang on, let me just check where he says from. He's from Lebanon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. He's a Orthodox um, Christian, I guess, from Lebanon. Quite interesting. Terrific. I thought Lebanon. I thought Lebanon's Christian main Christian denomination was a Roman a Romanist. Yeah, it was. It is actually Catholic. Um, he's he says he's Orthodox on his father's side, but Catholic on his mother's side. 
okay, well. <laughs> just make it an ethnic religion. <laughs> That's yeah. like Jewish. What does Jewish even mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what does Christian mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, should we jump right into it, um, Dylan? Uh, let's let's talk about the. Oh, this is quite interesting. I want to. I want to. I don't know if you guys are too well versed about this, but I'd like to learn a little bit more about it. Is the the sort of the economic problems with uh, with democracy, and um, if we really need democracy for coin, as Dylan would put it. <laughs> eh? Yeah. Um... Yeah, well, so I guess the question is, you know, what what comes first, the chicken or the egg? So a lot of people will say, if you look at rich countries, most of them are democracies. But the interesting thing about that is, a, in recent times, most countries which have gotten rich weren't democracies. And the ones that are rich now weren't democracies, most of them, before they became rich. And the ones that were uh, um, had democratic elements, had a severely restrictive franchise, which they do not have today. So mm. I guess on its face of it from a historical perspective, no. Yeah, Russell, I don't know if you know much about that. Do you want to try and... Well, look, the thing is, uh, um, at the end of the day, I mean, democracy, what is democracy? It's basically uh, we, we, we elected, rep elected representatives making decisions and legislating. Uh, in the best interests of um, of a particular nation, um, I don't think that is required. That uh, um, um, it, it can it can affect what would be considered investment and trade amongst people. Um, obviously, there's laws in it that can be passed that can either make it better or worse. But you don't need a democracy to pass those laws, um, making it good or uh, either better or worse. Um, What's important uh, is under, it's, it wasn't democ. I don't think it was democracies, democracy in and of itself that created wealthy countries. I just thought it was a commitment to rule of law um, yeah. and uh, and a consensus and the ability to trade freely with each other that created. It wasn't democracies. It wasn't politicians sitting around and deciding where money should go, making mm. countries wealthy. That's what yeah. I would. That's where. Oh, that's what I would say. Yeah, it was a lack of uncertainty and chaos is what it is. It was that's that's the main thing, I think, <clears throat> as far as government um, involvement goes, is making sure that it's a stable or fairly stable environment. So you're not worried about the state uh, <laughs> expropriating <laughs> land, for instance, or you're not yeah. worried about uh, going through some. Byzantine labyrinth legal code in order to get anything done. You want to be able to understand what the rules are and have reasonable expectation that the rules are going to be enforced. And you don't need democracy for that. You just don't. So, and if you look at historically, a lot of uh, countries that became rich, modern examples, of course, there's uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Chile. Uh, Venezuela was actually quite rich until Ch Chavez, <laughs> basically. The scourge of socialism took hold. Yes, the scour scourge of socialism and uh, South Korea. And all these countries actually became rich under either colonial governments like Hong Kong, which was undemocratic, or some form of uh, caretaker government authoritarian sort of dictatorship it's very if interesting go, that i didn't because yeah, like i, I said earlier on when we were talking is that you know democracy is viewed by a lot of intellectuals as a sort of a trojan horse for for socialism and you know as soon as as soon as democracy comes in play in these countries i mean obviously you know hong kong's different but countries like venezuela and stuff and as soon as you know democracy takes hold then socialism sort of wangles its way in there, and and then all all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Well, and Hong Kong's in. I mean, Zimbabwe is a democracy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There you go. So is South Africa, and so is a lot of places <laughs> that you don't necessarily want to live. But um. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Hong Kong's interesting because 
Although I guess the the um, <clears throat> the ruling power had democratic elements, the British Empire. Uh, the people of Hong Kong really didn't have a say in how things were governed, and the colonial government of the time, thankfully, had a very sort of um, laissez-faire disposition in regards to economics. So they had, again, sort of a top-down legal structure that the colonial government said these are the rules, and you know you're going to follow them basically. But as far as enterprise goes, do what you want, mm. essentially. And uh, Hong Kong became very rich as a result. Singapore, of course, a very famous multicultural society, which has explicitly fairly undemocratic and authoritarian in some regards. Also very rich. Venezuela, despite it being a complete shithole today, was actually very rich by Latin American standards up until... I think the 90s when they transitioned to from a military dictatorship or a junta as it was uh, into a democratic system. Uh, Argentina and some other places the same thing. Taiwan was governed by Lee Kuan Yew. Or, I'm sorry, not Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, that was Singapore, but mm -hmm. Chiang Kai-shek. So after the Chinese nationalists were driven out by Mao Zedong, they fled to Taiwan, and then they basically set up an authoritarian military dictatorship there, which, you know, they got which pretty quick. Same yeah, thing with Chile. Taiwan is, Taiwan is an, an anomaly in itself. I mean, mm -hmm. but sort of in the, what is it? Uh, they've, they've kind of faded out now, right? I mean, I don't know. Uh, in the 90s and stuff, they were, what is it, 90s and stuff, they were like all, like super wealthy, right? Yeah, yeah, no, and they, they, they still are by world standards. Taiwan, no doubt about it, very first world, very prosperous, very rich country with Western style standards of living. Um, Chile, uh, it was an interesting situation. You know, our, our old, uh, old hero, Mi General. <laughs> yeah, old. Um, Pinochet. Yeah. Augusto. You know, you know I got old, old Augusto, he, uh, he, put, he set things right. So they had a civil war and they came out on top. It was a very similar situation to uh, Spain, actually. And South Korea was governed by Park Chung-hee. So after the Korean War, they had a military dictatorship until, God, like 1998 or something. So democracy is a new thing in Korea as well. And if you look at a more, if you look further back, they'll say, well, what about all these European countries with their enlightenment values and stuff. Oh, it's a, it's a funny, <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, I mean, you keep going down the list. Uh, the German Empire was ruled by the Kaiser until the end of World War I. So they got rich before democracy. Uh, Franco, Spain, France, um, uh, Francisco Franco, the often called fascist, but he's, he wasn't really. He utilized fascists, but he was essentially military dictator of Spain. He started getting things ro rolling for Spain and they became rich after he took power. Same thing with Portugal. Portugal was governed by a guy called Salazar and his government was uh, technically a clerical fascist regime. So it was basically just an authoritarian, um, Catholic, uh, confessionally Catholic uh, regime. Uh, France, they had fits of fits and starts of democracy since the revolution, but for a large chunk of time, they really kind of got rich and started going off under the um, the various uh, French empires that they had. And Japan, Japan was explicitly undemocratic until after World War II, and they also got rich. So, so Dylan, um, seeing as though. I don't know what you're trying to do. I don't know if you're trying to make me throw up or something, all this, you know, French Revolution rhetoric that you're talking about over here. It's, uh, it's kind of making me nauseous. Um, but uh, is, that, is that essentially um, where the foundations for modern-day democracy came from? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it really got popularized after the French Revolution with the American experiment so the first real republic 
in modern times, which we'd consider a modern republic, was actually the Netherlands, as I recall. But um, yeah. America kicked it up a notch. But the thing people need to realize is that although they did have elements of voting, the franchise was extremely restrictive. And it was restrictive in all these countries up until very recently. So in the United States, uh, only something like 20% of white um, males in the United States actually were even eligible to vote. So it wasn't even, hey, you just need to be a white dude and you can vote. It's, it's like, no, you, you need to be a land-owning, tax-paying, uh, you know, landed gentry, basically, or, or part of the merchant class to even have a say in government. And that was yeah, yeah, the case for a while. Qualified franchise. Yeah. It was very qualified, <laughs> very qualified, very high you think threshold. qualified franchise. <laughs> I've, always, the most qualified. I've always liked the, the cultural interpretations of uh, democracy. Like if you read what, I've read what Lee Kuan Yew said about democracy, and I'm actually just trying to search for his quote here, but, but um, it, it, it basically he said, <clears throat> it is assumed in a democracy that all uh, uh, that everyone is equal, hence one man, one vote. But what if all everyone is not equal? Then surely to insist upon democracy must lead to regression. Yeah. No, I, that's, I think that's... that's and exactly he, also, that. he, also, he also had a quote where he, he, he quite bluntly said, he quite, quite bluntly said, he said democracy... Um, in Asian, in, in Far East, he made the comment, I, I don't want to misquote him or anything, but it goes somewhere along these lines where he said a Far East Asian ethnic Chinese person or Japanese person doesn't value uh, uh, democracy as highly as a, as a Western person and personal freedoms and all this stuff. What they value is efficiency and that things are actually happening. What do you know? In other words, if, if, if the person can deliver, who cares about democracy? Yeah. You know yeah. what the interesting thing is, what I, what I find so interesting and so fascinating about the, the, the punt for democracy is that, um, you know, you've heard, you've heard the saying and, and this line going around that um, this wasn't real socialism or, or that wasn't real communism or whatever it is. There's Nobody's a, saying that wasn't real democracy. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a tendency for, for people to start, I, I mean, I can probably see it happening. This wasn't real democracy or whatever. Because, you know, it's, it's kind of like a mild, gentle socialism is democracy, really, in a nutshell. Yeah, you know, that's certainly been the effect. I mean, um, <clears throat> you give people the ability to vote for other people's stuff, and they will every time. But that's, Unfortunately. But, that's why, but that's why I didn't, because people and humans are are actually, in my opinion, are actually, I mean, if you look at this from a social perspective, humans are actually naturally socialist. And that's why I think, I think that's why, um, I think that's why socialism in the general populace and stuff is such an easy sell. And that's why I think democracy is also such an easy sell to people. From yeah, a, from a social perspective, I, I I just think it's such an easy, easy for people to understand. You know, a simple thing. Yeah, I would say that um, so socialism works very well in the family unit, but once you start going beyond that, I think the idea of a of a, of a socialist society is kind of anathema to a lot of cultures historically. It might play on their ideas of fairness or um, Christian charity or equality if you come from a society that values those things. But typically, all cultures throughout history, until quite recently, have had notable and explicit hierarchies. Yeah, and, but uh, what, what, I, what I mean by, by humans being naturally social or socialist is that is that humans will naturally sort of gravitate towards oh, an okay. in-group preference kind of thing. Like there's, humans can never, this whole idea of like the individual, the individual is great, oh, but, okay. but humans are naturally going to sort of start groups and start, oh, you understand? So, 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 so you're, talk, 
Mm. Humans are kind of by nature or communal. Yes, right? yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so the, the notion of, you know, sort of micro socialism and stuff is fantastic. That's like fraternity and all of that. But is it, you know, the moment you start upscaling that sort of thing and it becomes a broad idea is the moment it starts getting, becoming cancerous and then it becomes people forcing their views on other people and, and all of that sort of thing. So that's, I don't know, it's a tricky one. It is. And uh, I think <clears throat> what you're talking about, people are inherently communal. This, this idea that you'll, of course, find some weirdos, and I'm sure the, the libertarian list in the industry will say, well, uh, excuse me, but uh, I'm a, <laughs> I am a rational individual, okay? And I, I got my copy of Atlas truck right here, and, and uh, you, don't know, you don't know what the hell you're talking about, dude. And I'll say to him, okay? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the 99.9% .9 of humanity who isn't Precisely. like that. And Precisely. as soon as you get married and have kids, you probably won't be either, if supposing you do. <laughs> so that's the thing. It's people are, there is no, there is no atomized individual. There's, you belong to a collective within a certain context so you are there's a balance between the one and the many yes i am i am dylan williams who is you know there's there's nobody like me but on the other hand i also have social obligations i have a family i have a language i have a religion i have a cultural heritage i have which 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 instilled in me a way of looking at things and i just can't get away from that yeah, so. precisely. So that's that's my idea, and and this is why I think that, you know, the idea of of um, of democracy is is a is a basic cell because people, you know, people understand that, Dylan. Like the the whole idea of you know your your family and your your community and your society and that sort of thing. So people see democracy as a way of as a way of almost fulfilling your obligations to the society and you understand as a yeah. as a voter and having your voice and now you sort of fulfilling your obligation to society so that in that sense it makes it an easy sell for for people you understand yeah. it, making any sense yeah. at all yeah and it and it and it uh plays to their natural um predilections to fairness or, or however they conceive of it and yeah, it's it's um, particular in in Western societies in particular. It's very uh, it's a very easy sell. Yeah, but that's why that's why you get this whole notion of um, it, it, it's almost like within within democracies and within countries and stuff that have voting systems like uh, or democratic voting systems and stuff. It almost seems as if they just want to keep trying democracy until they get it right. It's like flogging a dead horse kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's, that's true. That's what, that's what it seems like. I mean, if you look at, it, it, let's take South Africa for example. I mean, the the, the standard democratic system that we have now, I, I mean, it's it it it's been around for twenty five years, which is not not nearly as long as other de democratic countries, but we can see clearly it's causing endless issues. Okay, instead of instead of trying to you know look at other ways of doing it, like the Cape Party, they punting the sort of direct democracy and it's a different way of looking at democracy and all of that. Instead of doing that, no, politicians will now go and try and flog a dead pony and it to death so they can get everything that they can out of the democracy. And I'll tell you why they do that. I'll tell you why. The only reason why is because, the, because politicians have a vested interest in maintaining and keeping power. That's the only reason why they do it. Finishing part. Yeah, look, uh, I, I would agree with you there, Scott. Uh, how can I put it? Um, a, 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 someone in a democratic elected uh, position, representative, um, an elected representative, is he just needs to win a couple of elections and he's fine. You know, that's all he needs to do. In the old days, the, the, the monarch itself, the, the monarch was incredibly um tied to the um to the people directly you know he he or she 
couldn't have revolts every two years on their on their, on their doorstep. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a kingdom. Um, yeah, but also you know, the difference between democracy and monarchy, is that the monarch doesn't isn't afraid of losing power. Correct, exactly. So he's going to actually he, he's not thinking short term with all the whole time, just winning another election. He's actually looking to actually make a, a situation that is sustainable, uh, uh, long term that um, that people can grow with, so that the nation can actually be uh, um, well looked after and everything. Whereas a, a someone an elected official, he's he's earning a fat salary. All these it's all over the world now. Um, they're earning fat salaries. They're just getting elected every five years or four years, and um, you know. It, 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 that's all they need to do, and then after a few terms, they can retire. They, that's it. They walk away from it. A, a monarch doesn't have that luxury mm. uh, to do that. Well, this is um, the thing, in democracies. There's two parties involved. It's the politician and the voter. Okay, and both of them. Something that I've noticed all around because I've done a bit of reading and stuff, and you know, listening to some uh, YouTube videos and all of that, and something that, that uh, I was chatting to Dylan early on about it, something that, that, that sticks out on both of those parties, so the voter and the politician, because those are the two parties involved in a democratic system, and then obviously the, the country and stuff, but that's aside. The two parties is the politician and the voter. The one thing that comes becomes so profoundly clear in, in both of those parties is self-interest. The, the, the voter has a, is voting based on self-interest and the politician is politicking based on self-interest. So that's, that's something that is profoundly evident and clear across both parties. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'd agree with you there. Yeah. No, that's true. And uh, I think everyone's going to be self-interested at some point, but the, the question is, is who's more likely to have their self-interests align between the people and the ruling elite. Well, that's, because, that's exactly, sorry, I, I, you picked up on my point and, and took the words right out of my mouth. Sorry, I forgot. Yeah. To, yeah. Oh, no, it's, it's no problem. But, um, but a lot of people assume with democracies that, hey, we're a democracy. We don't have an elite. We don't have a, an aristocracy or whatever. No, you do. It's just by <laughs> it's just by another name. <laughs> now, yeah, look, instead of to think like that, to think like that is 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 incredibly naive and wishful thinking. It's that is diabolical. That it's clown world nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> the degeneracy. Um, it's degeneracy. It's degenerate thinking. But uh, th that's the thing, you know. It's now the the elites are just. They just wear they wear a suit instead of a crown, you know, uh, and people need to realize that the and you don't you don't even need to look that hard for it. I mean, South Africa is an excellent example. How many people do we basically know for sure have screwed over the country, embezzled billions of rands, <laughs> and totally, you know, just violated people's legal legal rights and stuff without being held account for it at all and well, it's, it's it's because it's that, it's, it's that short-term self-interest that's all it is it is and and it also goes to the point that yes th they are elites <laughs> you know and whether you vote for them or not at the end of the day their odds are they're not going to be held accountable it's just the same thing in the u.s yeah people violate the constitution all the time uh the uh, the patriot act um some of these uh wars that have been going on over the past 50 years or so nothing constitutional yeah. about that but nobody's held to account <laughs> the, the welfare state's yeah. not constitutional but it happens anyways <laughs> hillary clinton's not in prison <laughs> even though she broke the law you know there's there's tons of examples of this and They'll say, yeah, but we have, we we can vote them out. Like, okay, but they still they're still laughing to the bank, all the way to the bank. And even though they might not be in power, their influence still remains. Well, so those people. Yeah, well, look, all they elected, all they um, henchmen are all around them in the system. Yeah, it's well, a deep it's, state, it's, man. Dylan, Dylan, it's basically the, voting someone in 
is like you've you've been given this sort of social mandate to to do all these things and you can pretty much do whatever you want because you you hey you've got the the, the vote you've got the vote you've got the majority vote you now in power you know you yeah. the, the people have spoken basically and now you know you can you can basically be the elite you 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 yeah. can do whatever you want in pretty much in a nutshell yeah you know that that's exactly that's exactly it so uh, the elites you're going to have them whether or not you have democracy or not that's just sort of how society is um you might not <laughs> you might not want to you might not want to believe that but it's true every society has elites and they always will whether it's a, a monarchy or democracy the, the the main thing that you have to contend with is who's um which elite is more likely to have their interests co-align with the population at large? So, the, <coughs> go ahead. What's that, Russell? One of the things about um, democracy is, as Scott said earlier, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things Scott said earlier is that democracy leads to socialism, but I'll take it one step forward. So uh, democracy leads to um, to tyranny. Um, to quote to quote C.S. Lewis, he said, "Yeah, of all tyrannies, because what happens is democracies think they are now morally endowed to do the, whatever they they've been elected by the people. So they, they they've kind of got this moral obligation, you know. So they feel quite good about themselves." That's but exactly I, what I was saying as well, Russell. Correct. And. And and what he said here is that of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victim may be the most oppressive. It may be yeah. better to live under robber barons than under omnipotent, omnipotent moral busybodies. The robber baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep. His cupidity may at some point be satiated. But those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, oh, it's, and, it's and terrific. That, that, you know, uh, 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 it's easy for democracy and uh, and elected officials to become tyrants because they overrate themselves. Yeah, and that's the other thing too. The 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 nature of the system gives them a moral smokescreen that authoritarian leaders or monarchs are not don't have the luxury of. <laughs> you know, Absolutely. so at least with the monarchy, you could say. You know, shit's terrible, and uh, uh, oh, there's one guy you can blame. It's, it's, it's the king. Yeah. And of course, the king might obf obfuscate a little bit and say, "Nah, I care about you. It's it's noble so and so, or this uh, provincial government, or whatever." And that that can happen. But the the fact is, is you have um, you do have, I think, a bit more of an eye on. Sort of who's calling the shots. So I think the honor Dylan, is. Dylan, did you just show like a like a um, a symbol I, of um, the Illuminati or something? Now, what? <laughs> <is that>? <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, <laughs> but um, where was I talking about? Oh, okay, yes. But um, elites, mm -hmm. time preference. Oh, time preference. That's the other thing too. So you mentioned, Scott, that the um, the bureaucrat or the politician is going to have a much higher time preference than the monarch, meaning they want things now, whereas the monarch is thinking about his heir. He's thinking about his dynasty. He's thinking about maintaining long -term goals. Long -term. Long -term goals. So I think that's just sort of inherent with a with a monarch is they're they're much more likely to be concerned about you know leaving the throne to an heir who doesn't have the population the or the pitchforks yeah mm. no 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 and, uh, that's that's you you're on a you're on the right path over here sorry carry on yeah uh so you you don't you you want to leave a stable and prosperous kingdom for your heir whereas the politician He's, he gets in there for four years, five years, whatever it may be, and he's just in there making deals, and he just wants to get elected again. He's on a four-year four in the U.S. 
if he's a president or two years if he's House Representative timetable in order to make some shit happen. <clears throat> and, you know, he makes all sorts of deals in order to get elected there. Uh, the voting pool has been diluted and denigrated by allowing more and more people to, <laughs> to have a say in how the system works. And uh, it's just it's just a mess. Yeah, so in terms of... If I can just if I can just sort of pose an argument there to that point, um, uh, so let's say so the whole the whole point that we're trying to make over here is that is that the difference between a democratically elected official and a a monarch is that uh, the monarch will be in it for for the the long run and the elected official will sort of get in there make a couple of deals. Uh, you know, he's not too concerned about how it will play out and all that sort of thing. But I think the argument would be is that we, we're we all sort of concerned about sustainability and yeah. our kids and our and the long-term goals and, and all that sort of thing. So if I were to pose an argument to that point is, you know, how do you know, how sure are you that an elected official is not in it for the long-term goal, I guess? Well, I guess in that instance, you just have to look at the track record, you know? Mm -hmm. And what have we seen over what, what we have seen over time is these political systems get more and more top heavy with every year that goes by. Um, more and more unfunded liabilities, more and more um, just promises that can never be fulfilled. And in the US's case, uh, decade after decade of military adventurous. <laughs> I think, so, I think I think what you generally see happening with elected officials and stuff, especially in South Africa, for example, is that you know they would want to sort of get into power. So let's say the the president of uh, South Africa, so um, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, is in power now, and he knows that as long as his party sort of maintains power, then his bread is going to be buttered on both sides. For the rest of his life, you know, after he's president and everything, they're going to look after him and all of that. So, in in that sense, I think that that he uh, sort of his main goal is to to sort of maintain power, and he's he's has a vested interest in maintaining power, and will do and make whatever slimy deals and you know pander to the voters and all of that just to maintain that power because he knows that as long as his power. Or as, as long as his party maintains absolute power forever, then he's in and that and that's sort of that's again the way that 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 um, uh, that democracy weeds its way in as socialism because socialism is essentially the the those political parties maintaining power forever. So it's basically replacing a monarchy with tyranny, like Russell said as well. Yeah. So it's an, another, yeah, another it's thing, an oligarchy. Just hmm. an interesting thing, Dylan, um, what you said, where you said that um, uh, the monarchies were the norm across Europe um, and in the old world and most of the world until World War I. Um, and it's very, very interesting that um, a lot of the um, World War I, the end of World War I or the beginning of World War I, it's, it, 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 the, the times intersect with the um we were discussing it about the welfare state as well as well um a, a monarchy ended democracy came in um central banking came in welfare state came in it, it all just seems to be a nice little uh, uh, interlocking um uh, uh, time frame so within about within about uh, uh, within one generation you had um uh, central banks everywhere you had democracies everywhere welfare states everywhere and um, these central banks and that sort of thing, essentially financing the wealthy, the, the, the welfare state, um, uh, uh, borrowing money from banks at interest and making banks rich. And that's it. Yeah, Russell, it's, it's, it's conveniently coincidental that, eh? Yeah. Well, it just seems to all line up if you look at the timeline. I'll uh, just ask Dylan, and he's a little bit more clued up historically, but it, is, it, it has that look about it. Yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. That I don't, I don't think any of that is by coincidence. The you you put in I think you hit the nail on the head, Russell. I think all these are tied together and they provide 
they 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 sort of reinforce one another you know so yeah, they, 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 they kind of it, it's like a it, it, they interlock so well that that they they, they 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 support one each other so well it's almost like it's I don't know it's it, it just seems so frustratingly hard to break yeah no and I think that's sort of one of the problems now is is, is, is thinking about how how do you unwind this because the biggest problem I think with democracy today is how easily it sells itself to most people like you're saying Scott mm -hmm. is mm. The, the current system it's just assumed to be a moral good but if you compare um, I was listening to a, a great lecture on this by uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe who's a libertarian philosopher and he had a really good insight about sort of democracy and in a historical perspective compared to monarchy and if you look at the numbers, it, democracy actually doesn't come out looking so good. In well, terms I mean, of something like talking about, talking about Hans Hermann Hoppe and stuff is he's, one of his arguments is he says sort of modern, modern democracies now, uh, that, that's again the argument is modern democracies are wealthier, I guess, than monarchies were. I guess relatively, um, but you know his argument is: it be, is it because of democracy, or in spite of democracy? I mean, yeah. but he's he's got yeah, you're right. He's got a fantastic insight on on democracy. I watched a couple yeah. of his lectures. Exactly, and uh, by by any number of metrics, so interest rates were uh, lower was one thing. Uh, you had significantly less inflation because you had hard money. Okay. The you didn't have the existence of central banking, uh, taxation was at significantly lower rates than it is today. Exactly. Um, and although you would frequently have, um, and and the wars that you did have at the time were wars of uh, succession, basically. So so and so would pass without a clear heir to the throne, and then different houses would be jockeying for position in order to get charged. That is the one thing that a proponent of democracy might support and actually have a point is, hey, you know, peaceful transition of power. That's the benefit of democracy. And while that is <laughs> usually the case, um, it, uh, it's not clear to me that the... Um, that, that on the whole, it's a more peaceful system. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have the, the reason, basically the reason why you don't have wars in Europe right now is because they're all integrated economically, I think, is, 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 is largely the reason. And also because you have the United States, which is a democracy and extremely aggressive internationally, throwing their weight around and preventing anybody from getting into too much trouble in Europe specifically. Yeah. So that is, those are good, those are good arguments for uh, democracy, Dylan. So the peaceful transition of power and like you said, Avia rightly said in the notes, uh, it allows for the removal of government if unsatisfied and people have a say in how the government works and like you said, uh, democracies tend to be richer and like we said as well earlier on, like I said, what Hans Hermann Hoppe said, um, but you know how, in the in the sense of a monarchy and stuff, how I mean, are you then sort of stuck with the king ruler, and if the king's an asshole, then well, you're screwed. You know, is that is that how it how it, it generally plays out? Hmm. Well, despite the. Um Despite the, uh, the, the, the notable abuse that kings were able to inflict on the population, they usually tended to be much more reserved. Um, exactly. We only get to hear of bad kings, really, in history. Yeah, and even Tsar Nicholas II in the October Revolution, when you had the, um, the, uh, the communists sort of take charge after the interim government 
and Tsar Nicholas abdicated the throne. Most Russians were actually perfectly happy to have the Tsar stay there. They didn't, they actually, <laughs> the Russians actually didn't want the Tsar to go. It was only a very small, um, again, elite, which was able to take charge, which also goes again to what we're saying that, hey, at least with democracy, people get to vote and have a say in the government. Well, in Russia's case, people still wanted the Tsar and then they got the Bolsheviks anyway, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, uh, so much for that great tolerant uh, democracy, huh? Yeah, and uh, it's the same thing too. In uh, I think Venezuela is an interesting modern example. So, you had a system of uh, military dictatorship for a long time, and they transition to democracy, and then they vote themselves more and more benefits from the government, and then eventually the system implodes economically. And then the elite, in order to maintain power, have basically now um, scrapped any pretenses of caring about what the public thinks too much. So I think that's the thing. Democracy, uh, when, when, when shit really hits, starts hitting the fan, they, they become just as authoritarian, if not more so, than the monarchs and authoritarian regimes that they replaced. Well, this is the thing is, you know, we, we don't really, it's like Russell said, it's a very good point, you know, when, when you hear, and this also leans, I don't know, it lends itself into this whole weird idea that, that, um, that the whole, like almost as if democracy has a fantastic media campaign and all that, in that you never really hear about any good kings. You only, whenever someone talks about kings, it's always this, framed as this, you know, horrible, uh, tyrannical leader and, and all of that. And, you know, when it's democracy, then it's, you know, the people voting for freedom and, you know, all of that. I, I don't know. I, you never, it's almost like democracy has this fantastic marketing campaign. Oh, it's, it's a, democracy has tremendous PR, <laughs> which I think is, it's, 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 it's best strength and, uh, most, most dangerous asset. But, um, you know, like I was saying, if, if you just look at the numbers, things that we would probably find um, in, intolerable are, are, are things that, that, that would sort of lend to us having good or bad opinions about the government, like monetary policy, taxation, and things like that. The monarchs, all, all the... All the data that Hoppe was looking at prior to World War I was aggregated, I think. So he was including the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was including uh, the, German, uh, the German Empire. He was including Britain and all these other places, the Czech Republic and whatnot. And yeah, they were – the government had a lot less to do in your day-to-day -day affairs than they do now. They just do. They, they didn't tax you near as much. They didn't um, – manipulate interest rates they didn't uh they, they didn't um print away your retirement savings into oblivion through inflation and the wars that they did have tended to be much more small in scope well i mean and, if you can if you can look at it like this dylan um again we're talking about a government sort of a government at the moment democratically elected government has a a sort of short to medium term goal so you know anything from five to ten to thirty years and some you know oligarchies and stuff like um like zimbabwe and all of that but um let's let's if, if you think about it like this okay a a monarchy has let me just think about this quickly so a monarchy doesn't have knows he doesn't have to sort of get in there plunder as much as he can and then sort of get out whereas a government knows they have a limited amount of time to get that that money could because i mean like we said a government a democratically elected government could be here today gone the next you understand so they know and they understand they've only got they've only got so, sort of like a, a a two over innings or whatever it is to, to get as much runs as they can through any way, shape, or, or form, whereas a, a monarchy knows that they have the eternity or whatever it is. So there's no 
there's no need to to steal and plunder and all that and it understands the monarchy also understands that um, in order for us to 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 have a happy kingdom and stuff our vested interest lies in the people of the kingdom because we now need to maintain this kingdom for centuries or whatever let's let's say for argument's sake or t decades or generations or whatever so we need to make sure that our people are happy mm. that's exactly right and the other thing too um that to the modern mind would be anathema but was also again the case historically this was the norm was uh all these monarchies were confessional religious states of one form or another. Um, so the monarch was expected. So the, the people say, oh, I laugh about the God ordained emperor and whatnot. The, the, the monarch the sovereign was confirmed in his position by the church usually. Mm. And there were instances in the past historically where monarchs, where they began to have trouble is when they began to inflict upon the population things which were seen to be against um, Christian teaching. A good example of this is uh, St. John Chrysostom, who was Archbishop of Constantinople in the B Byzantine Empire. And he was actually, in, in addition to being the archbishop of the capital of the Byzantine Empire. He got on the emperor's case a lot. So he supported the monarchy and whatnot, but he was, he was actually banished, exiled twice for basically speaking out against the, the empire. And because of the pressure, um, the Byzantine Empire had to undergo certain reforms in order to, again, fall in line more with um, Christian teaching. Absolutely. So, um, can I? I just want to move on over here, guys, because I want to talk about uh, the two different um, feasible types of uh, democracy, or the two sort of modern democracies, which is obviously representative democracy, which is the democracy in the U.S. and the democracy in South Africa is all representative uh, democracy. And then I want to discuss, you know, what what. I'm sure what, what all of us would agree is the only form of democracy that that might work on a sort of a micro scale, which is direct democracy. Um, do you want to, Dylan, do you want to sort of elaborate a little bit more on uh, representative democracy then? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, representative democracy is what most people have in mind when they think of democracy, meaning that the population elects a representative of a certain area Sorry, and I'm they run to the restroom quick excuse me okay yeah so um the the people vote a representative that representative supposedly represents their interest in the lead in the legislature so in the united states what we have is the house of representatives we have 435 representatives who supposedly represent the people um, South Africa has parliament, so you vote for the party. And the parliamentarians supposedly represent the interests of their um, electorate. That's the most common form of democracy by far. The other one is, and that's representative democracy. Direct democracy is basically a true sort of one man, one vote system where you have a, uh, um, a situation where basically everything functions more like a referendum. So an example of this would be Brexit, where the population at large voted on a referendum for the UK to leave the European Union. That's an example of direct democracy in action, and where you mostly see direct democracy happening in modern times is through referenda, binding referendum. Uh, local government will have some degree of direct democracy. So in my little podunk town of Wasilla, Alaska, I think they had a, they had direct democracy to see if the borough should increase the sales tax by 1% or if they should get a bond in order to fund education further, stuff like that. 
So in, in that situation, the public is basically, in, it's, in, it's incumbent on them to sort of make the choices. Okay. Mm, mm, mm. So right. that's, that's why, that's exactly why, that's exactly why the the direct democracy sort of works well in the sense of, um, in the sense like sort of a micro, a very sort of small community kind of, kind of thing. But the moment you try, it's like you say, then the moment you try to sort of expand on that and, and scale it, it becomes tricky and difficult. Yeah, you know, it becomes a bit more uh, difficult to sort of have that sort of thing happen. It also becomes difficult in uh, multicultural societies where different groups have different interests, different values. Uh, they might not even want the same goals. So a lot of times people say, well, don't we all want the same thing? Not necessarily, <laughs> you know? So, and in that sort of situation, I think you're just sort of asking for trouble. Uh, the instances where, again, you direct democracy really does seem to work fairly well is when it's confined to a fairly small jurisdiction. So the most famous example of this is in Switzerland. So Switzerland is divided into many small jurisdictions called cantons. And in, that, in those cantons, the population have very large sweeping controls over taxation, education, whatever it might be, and the people vote for it directly themselves. Definitely. So it's, it's, it's like, um, it's also, you know, the, the, the Swiss, um, uh, their, their, national, their national government and stuff can't really even make any decisions without the cantons agreeing on anything. Is that correct? Or? Yeah, uh, they are afforded... Um, significantly less power than um, most most uh, central governments are. And the, the Switzerland is much more of a confederation of cantons than it is a... Um, than it is a government. Yeah, it, than it well, is well, a, the, it, than it is a unitary state. The, what I understand about the Swiss Federation is that the, if they need um, money, they've actually, they've only got money that the cantons give them. They don't. They don't yeah. tax people directly. They tax the cantons, or the cantons have to hand over whatever they've got, or, or something like that. They don't. They don't tax people on the ground directly. The central government. Um, they the central government, whatever form that is, have to actually go and ask the cantons for money. You see, this is the thing. Is I mean, I mean, that all sounds fantastic. You know, um, as long as. I think it's I think it's a fantastic idea this sort of direct democracy and stuff. But as long as you don't have a an overreaching government, and it's very rare, very rare. Let's let's be honest of here. You know, big government and stuff. It's 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 almost never happened that a big government is not overreaching. And and that's why I'm saying the moment you try and scale it, the moment. Um, government works on a on a good sort of PR campaign to sell the idea of you know national democracy or or representative democracy to the populace and all of that is the moment that all falls apart mm, yeah so it's no, not sustainable i mean this is the whole thing is anyone that believes that the democratic system or a democratic system in a, in any country whether it's on the large scale of representative democracy or whether it's micro direct democracy and stuff it's just not sustainable we can we can understand that it's just because then it leads to socialism it just leads to socialism and then it leads to absolute power by the state and what another what's the difference between having absolute power by the state or absolute power by a monarchy and we've known we've discussed the difference the difference is is that a monarchy knows that they don't have, they can't be here today, gone the next. Whereas the government knows they're here today, gone the next. They need to get in there, steal, plunder, and everything, and get the hell out of Dodge. That's yeah. Well, look, look at look at look at how much money is in politics these days. No wonder it's attracting all these weirdos and that sort of thing that rate themselves. And I mean, I don't know what it is in other countries, but if you look at South Africa's history up until up until the nineteen late nineteen eighties, parliamentarians 
um, lived in basic housing in Arcacia Park in Goodwood. Um, they didn't earn the 1.2 million rand a year that they're each earning now, minimum, all right, um, that's being earned now. Um, you didn't get, um, a, a, if you were a town councillor in the, in the local city municipal setup, you didn't get a salary. You just earned money uh, um, going uh, a stipend for attending meetings. Um, these sorts of things were, um, and the problem is the amount of money involved in politics these days is attracting all the parasites, yeah. um, like what Scott says. You know, all these guys are parasites, and you need to actually, because in the old days, guys didn't make any money. If you look at leaders of, of, of countries, how they actually lived in that sort of thing in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it was actually very, very basic. 80s, it started getting out of control in the 90s. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking specifically about South Africa, but I don't know if it was the same everywhere else in the world. But um, yeah, the, it, 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 it's, politics attracts the wrong person at the same time. Hundred percent. So what I want to, I, I want to, um, guys, we've been going for almost like 50 minutes. We've got about another 10, 20 minutes or something. What I want to talk about. Um, so we've gone through uh, representative democracy and direct democracy and and how that would sort of play out and what we believe to be the only mildly um, feasible idea of um, democracy and stuff. So let's, let's just briefly run through monarchies and, and what monarchies are. Um, monarchy was usually peaceful internally until there was a question of secession and stuff. Uh, Dylan, you made notes over here. Um, wars weren't ideologically, typically. Ideological, sorry. Typically. Yeah, they're typically wars of succession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then blames could be placed on one guy and regimes, and that was also sort of tempered by Christian values. So, what's the best choice, guys? <laughs> See, that's the thing. I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, there's we've we've seen instances of democracies that we want to live in but the question is is whether long term there'll be places we want to keep living in them you know um right now a lot of the wealth that we're seeing is based off the fumes that they have uh, based is it's they're, they're basically running off the the hard work that was put in centuries ago by much less democratic systems so the, the i don't know I, I i'm kind of at a loss i i i, I used to be an, an anarcho capitalist until fairly yeah. recently I now i'm now, you, you wrote on the thing and capri question yeah, yeah and capri <laughs> question right? so look i i'm not exactly sure right now as far as forms of government go i think direct democracy is a is an interesting ingredient that I, th I would like to see sort of implemented a bit more. So by people sort of having a direct, a direct role in their, um, you know, a, a truly direct role, not just one where they elect some bum to represent them in Washington or Cape Town, Pretoria, wherever it is. Um, I think you were probably much more likely to get better results with that. Uh, the Swiss have kind of proven that that system at least works to some degree. I'm not too keyed in on the inner workings and intrigues of Swiss politics, but it does seem to work fairly well. And largely the reason of that, I think, is because of the federalism and how each individual canton, they sort of have their own ethnic and linguistic um, culture and heritage, and they're pretty jealous of those and they don't want to see them uh, co-opted. I think even to move to somewhere in a canton, you're not approved for immigration by the uh, national government. You're, you're sort of okayed by the canton you're trying to move into. Yes, so, sure. so it's, um, yeah, it's a very, very different system and kind of outside it's, it's, it's democratic, but on a much more, localized level where the controls are within the community. 
So you don't have a large unitary state calling the shots like you do in most of the rest of the world. So I think um, I think old uh, Roman Kabanak is going to love us because I think inadvertently, if not making an argument for monarchy, we made an <laughs> argument for Anne Capri. <laughs> Anne Capri. <laughs> well, well, that's that's. Yeah, I don't know. So, I'll but, but well, I'd, I'd honestly, I mean, just you know, anarchy aside and stuff, I would, I'd probably, I'd probably prefer uh, Anne Capri to modern day representative democracy, to be honest. Yeah, and and I, I think that the thing the maybe, maybe we could do a whole episode on anarcho capitalism, but uh, the the interesting thing about it, I think a lot of people assume that eh, it's a world without rules and stuff. No, it's just rules by other means. Again, we, we all acknowledge there's going to be elites, sure. and there would be in a largely mercantilist sort of, or I'm sorry, merchant merchant class dominated society like that. Sure. Um, I'm not. I don't really consider myself much of an ANCAP anymore. I think probably in forms of government, I, I really don't know what's the best situation. I think it sort of also depends on the environment. Yeah. So. Sure. Um, Guys, I need to. I'm gonna need to um, cut this broadcast a little bit shorter over here because my wife's already giving me the evil eye because we have a the, day yeah. of outings planned. We're oh, going yeah, to, okay. we're going to, wait, yeah, 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 yeah. Russell can give your closing thoughts and stuff. And then yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We need to move to the. We need to. It's basically. I say just whatever you do, limit the limit the power of the state in people's lives. So I was thinking to myself, okay. Let's put myself in the position. What would I do if I was going to give, how would I be a good dictator? All right. <laughs> so these are the only areas of government that I would like control over. The military, the police force, the courts, foreign affairs, the treasury. Um, that's it. You can have the rest. Do as you please. That's my yeah. solution. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, Mike, uh, Dylan, you okay, want to give your closing? All the important ones. Yeah. All the important ones. Police, courts, uh, courts and justice. Um, I'll appoint all the judges. Um, yeah, and no one's going to tell me who to appoint either. <laughs> so, so, so basically, law and order. All the, other, all, the, all the other departments, the education. If you you do what you want, healthcare. You do what you want, education. You do what you want, everywhere else. That's it. But that's yeah. a form of limited government, essentially. Uh, Dylan, you want to give some closing statements there? Yeah, sure. I guess if, as far as I, I can see, you know, maybe some form of democracy mixed with a constitutional monarchy or something. The, the, the thing is, is to assume that, I guess my last, my last dig at, rep, at democracy is to assume that these people represent you is ridiculous. In, in the United States... The current uh, amount of representation is one representative per every like three quarters of a million voters. There's absolutely no way that one guy can represent the interests of three quarters of a million people. If you had the same ratio of representation in colonial America as you did now, eight states would have one representative and five states would have none. So it's just, there's just, that's not representative democracy. That's pathetic. Yeah. So, um, and, in closing, and you can't make it bigger is the problem. Cause if you make the body too big, then you basically have a literal city of legislatures and it's just gridlock and nightmare. So, well, that's the whole idea behind democracy is that uh, for me, I truly believe, uh, democracy, regardless of whether it's direct democracy or representative democracy, I believe it to legitimately be a Trojan horse for socialism, and it leads to that. And just like socialists say, guys, this is not real socialism, I think we need to stop punting the line of perhaps this is not real democracy kind of thing and stop flogging a dead pony and uh, figure out how to change it. Um, I think it's a 250-year-old failed social experiment. And we need to start looking outside of the box and looking at other ideas, like Dylan said, perhaps some sort of um, democracy with um, uh, some, sort of democracy. some sort of direct democracy with like constitutional uh, monarchy or something like that. Some sort of 
different system because you know we it's quite clear that the that the current one is not working so um guys what before we close up we want to just briefly spend a minute or two talking about uh next week's episode next week's episode is going to be quite interesting it's going to be <laughs> we're going to be bringing up some uh some interesting uh, conspiracy theories and stuff you know? <laughs> then you want to do the alex jones you want to do the alex jones voice oh yeah sure I'm going to tell you right now, folks, this guy, I'm sitting here in the office at the underground, and we're going to be talking about conspiracies, okay? Gulf of Tonkin, the Federal Reserve, the Bilderbergs, all of it's going to be coming out. Yeah, it's going to be coming out. This is all going to be coming out. There's a war for your mind. (laughs) There's a war for your minds, okay, folks? But yeah. (laughs) It's an infinite war. (laughs) It's an infinite war, yeah. But uh, yeah, long story short, I think we're going to be talking about uh, real-life conspiracies. This is not speculation. This is not... You know, something your crazy uncle is talking about. We're going to be sort of talking about real life conspiracies. Yeah, sort of. Um, not, conspiracies not, that came true. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Conspiracies that actually can be proven as real life conspiracies and that might have sort of sounded weird and wacky at the time, but for the moment they came true, they were real. So anyway, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening. I need to run now because I need to go on some outings and go and explore Los Angeles. Yeah, go and explore. Go hopefully, and hopefully I don't have to be dodging human feces on the pavements and stuff, but um, <laughs> let's... Uh, <laughs> Get accused of sexual assault one. just looking at some chick, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, guys, I'm going to stop the broadcast. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Put the bell or hit the bell icon over there for notifications. If you have any comments, leave them down below. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Stay reactionary out there because God wills it. God wills it. Cheers, guys. Cheers.